So one of these questions come up as we're talking about goodness and the form of the good, and the question is this. Will I be better off being moral or being immoral? Any first impressions? Will I be better off being moral or being immoral? <coughs> if I'm aiming for selfish benefit, the moral guy is happier, healthier, has, a, has more success in life? Well, if you're aiming for self-benefit, then immoral. Because it's all about... Well, that's what he means, right? Well, how do I personally become better off? Is it by following the rules or is it by breaking the rules? Breaking the rules. Yeah? How many people say morality makes you better off? How many say morality comes at a cost and ends up harming you a lot of the time? Alright. Plato wants to say that being better off means being moral. That all morality benefits you. Now, Callicles, does anybody remember him? I'm not sure if I mentioned him here. Okay, Antiphon and Callicles, they're, they're both friends here. They argued that laws were made up by people in power to keep the power. You guys remember that? Yeah, yeah. He was saying that, that we just make up the rules arbitrarily, to, and whoever makes up the rules is making them to benefit themselves. There's no such thing as morality. Rules are meant to be broken here. So we have two composing views here. One that says morality makes me better off, and one that says morality actually harms me, that it's to my detriment, that the good guys finish last, that following the rules means that you get shafted, and breaking the rules, like cheating and stealing, means that you get good grades and become rich. And so it seems like uh, they're trying to solve this dispute. So Plato quotes Thrasymachus in order to represent the opposition here. The opposition says, Morality and right and wrong are actually good for someone else. They're to the advantage of the stronger party, the ruler, and bad for the underling at the receiving end of the orders. In any and every situation, the moral person is worse off than the immoral one. Immorality is profitable and advantageous to oneself. So what's your impressions of Thrasymachus real quick? He's, all He's a businessman. Is he right, though? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the immoral people <laughs> prosper while the moral people, people fail? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like in our society, we would hope that it's the other way around. But In what way did the immoral prosper? Why well, steal to get to, you know, to get more or to prosper? So when you say prosper, are you talking like money? Pretty much, yeah. that, that's one way to get money, right? If you yeah. steal, you are definitely going to increase your money. Right. Anything else that you gain by immorality? Notoriety. So you can get some fame out of it. What else? Not following the rules, like cheating, basically. And what does that give you that's supposed to be good for you? It's freedom. <laughs> Alright, so money, fame, and freedom. Those make you better off? American. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we certainly like them, right? Our culture is actually really obsessed with these things. So is that what makes you have a good life? To us, that's what we feel makes us have a good life. Okay, fair enough. So if you're immoral, you gain those things and you, and you benefit them. What is Plato's definition of a good life? Honestly. Doing good. Happiness. It's, it's bound up, but think about the charioteer. Good things in order. If your soul is in harmony your soul's rich? Is that what he's saying? Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't have to do with money frame. It has to do with the soul in harmony. Can you be rich and have a soul in disharmony? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he doesn't think that these things are actually what constitutes a good life. He says a moral person is one who benefits. But benefit is to, described in order of how your soul's looking, not your bank account. So Plato's going to stick to his guns here and say the moral person does benefit. <coughs> doesn't mean he's the richest. It means he's the best off. And just because you're richer than me, simply doesn't mean you're better off. That's Socrates. What's that? Kind of like Socrates it is. It's a lot like Socrates, and since Plato wrote down everything Socrates said, it's not too surprising, right? Yeah. In fact, Plato has a little bit of leeway here, right? When you're telling Socrates' story and you're like the only person writing about it, you can make that story sound, uh, sand off some edges, make it sound like you want to say, right? So quite possible that he uses Socrates um, to make his points for him at times. So, speaking of Socrates, Plato appeals to a story about Socrates that helps explain this particular problem. It's called the Ring of Gyges, and it's a, it's a conversation between a man named Glaucon and, and Socrates. 
So let's take a quick look at that story. You know what? We're not going to read it in the book. I'm just going to tell it. I'm going to tell it to you. There's a guy. He's a shepherd, and he's poor, because uh, shepherds in that day aren't exactly the high rollers in society. Uh, there's an earthquake, and it splits open the earth, and the shepherd goes and checks it out, and he finds all kinds of riches. Right? There's all strange things, talismans and gold and coins in this in this cave. And he also realizes something very strange. There's a dead cyclops with a ring on its finger. And he pulls the ring off and puts it on his own finger and twists the, he's twisting, he's playing with it, right? And when he twists it around backwards, he becomes invisible. His friends that he's shown this cave to no longer see him. And he realizes, wow, I can get away with pretty much anything I want right now. I, I essentially have superpowers now. I've stumbled <coughs> onto a magical ring, and now I can't be stopped. So you think this guy stays a shepherd? No, right? In the story, he's able to sleep with the king's wife, overthrow the king, and now he lives a life where he's got money, fame, and freedom right? in spades. So, it's supposed to show the purpose of the story is Glaucon is arguing that the person who abuses his power and acts immorally, he breaks all the rules. The second that he no longer is able to be caught, he breaks all the rules and selfishly pursues his own well-being. So breaking the rules, being immoral, leads to prosperousness. That you will definitely get money, fame, and power by abusing and breaking all the rules that you can. If we only had the power, Glaucon argues, we would break all the rules. That we don't actually care about morality, we care about self-interest. And the ring helps us realize that breaking the rules is in our self-interest. So what do you think of that argument? Let me ask a slightly different question, actually. How would you like that ring? Would anybody turn down the ring? <laughs> you would turn down the ring? How many people say you turn down the ring? You could drive an invisible people. So, that's interesting. Usually I get nobody saying they, they turn down the ring. You don't have to steal, you just have fun with it. <coughs> how, many, how many of y'all would stay in poverty if you had a ring to turn you invisible? What? I'm Robin. <laughs> You're Robin? I'm Robin. I'm uh. Robin and Robin. <laughs> so, Glaucon says right. that in this classroom, we might be like, oh, I'm not going to use the ring. But if we give it to you in the privacy of your own, where nobody can cast judgment, nobody like can I'm condemn you, turn invisible, and I'm I give you some, every cop in the face. I give you some superpowers, that you're going to pursue your self-interest in an unbridled way. You're not going to be bound by morality anymore. So he's saying human beings are selfish and we're willing to be immoral, and then in fact, being immoral would benefit us. Now, Socrates also has a little piece of this conversation. What do you think Socrates would do? Not Keep it so nobody else can use it. Right, so, so Socrates is going to go find uh, Mordor and chuck it in the fire. Wait, that's, wrong. that's the wrong story. <laughs> Does that story ring a bell, though? Yes. All right, it's totally based. Lord of the Rings. How many of you have not seen Lord of the Rings? Okay, so, so this is not going to make too much sense to you. But Lord of the Rings is based off of this story. There's a ring that can make you invisible. You can break all the rules. Uh, everybody's abusing the power. One guy is like, hey, this is too strong. I need to throw it away. Right, that's Socrates in this story. Socrates says he's not going to be using the power. So let me ask you this question. In the Lord of the Rings, does using the ring make you happy? Break the it makes you invisible, gives you lots of powers, also makes you crazy and sends the Dark Lord after you, right? So that's a downside, <laughs> not found in Glaucon's story. Okay. You guys remember Smeagol? Yes. Yeah. Right, how's, how's he turn out? Weird. He's happy? Weird. He's not happy, alright? So the, the writer of The Lord of the Rings clearly has an agenda. He's retelling the story, and his position is whoever uses the ring becomes less happy. He's clearly stating his opinion on this. But who do you guys think is actually less happy? Glaucon, who, be, who be, goes from shepherd to being a king, or Socrates, who throws the thing away and stays a shepherd? You think he's going to be happier and, and healthier and better off? Okay, that's actually the point here. Is he going to be richer? No. no. Is he going to be better off soul-wise? Yes. That's what Socrates really cares about, and actually, and Plato too. He thinks that's what all of us care about that we all actually want to be better off soul-wise. We convince ourselves that money, fame, and power make us better off soul-wise. But he thinks we're mistaken. That Glaucon is actually going to be miserable here. That by pursuing his desires, are these not fleshly desires? Yes. Mm -hmm. right? 
if we get a ring and I say, all right, now my desires can run free, I'm going to let them govern my life. That's going to make my life better? No, having a life that's governed by desires means reason gets subverted and you end up in misery. You end up in disharmony. So he says, although we think we like it, it's because we've lied to ourselves. Our culture has continually lied to us since birth and told us the way to be happy is by the fulfilling of our carnal desires. And from, from Plato's perspective, that's actually insufficient. Did I, guys tell you, did I tell you guys the story of when I got in a car crash? Mm -hmm. yeah. like how it totally subverted the things I thought were awesome? And it, it changes your perspective, makes you see things that are once really meaningful to you is not so important. That's essentially what Plato's arguing for here. He says, we think these things are really matter, but at the end of the day, it's unfulfilling. It's not a path towards happiness. It's not a path that will actually make us better off. So the ultimate argument here is don't be like Spiegel. Yes. <laughs> now, knowing this, does that mean you turn down the ring all of a sudden? No. no. We still, no matter how much we hear it, right, we still believe this. It's hard to stop believing that money, fame, and power are going to make us better off. But Plato thinks that we're mistaken here. What do you think about other people? Some random person, not you. Right? A random person stumbles onto the ring. Do you think this will make their life happier, or do you think it will end in misery? Misery. Yeah? I don't know. It will make me happy. So, I realize we have a blind spot for ourselves. We think it'll make us happy. Right? But evaluate it in someone else. A stranger finds the ring. And you're a, you're a betting man, right? Or a betting woman. Do you think they're going to be better off or worse off after having this ring? But the whole ring just exacerbate your, your desires. The ring only gives you power. And it turns out, I think the ring doesn't help me reason. Right? It doesn't help me pursue wisdom. Turning invisible does not make me smarter, does not make me more dedicated to learning, does not make me more open-minded. What can the ring help with? Makes you more dangerous. Isn't it? Money, power, fame, wealth, desire, 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 desire. Right? It, gives my, it gives the wild horse a lot more strength. That's all it does for us. If you think about it, you could, like, you could argue that it, I'm using the ring to pursue knowledge because this person has this number of books that I would like to read. <laughs> if you steal the books, though, that's something that Socrates and Plato think a wise person can't do. Because they think wisdom is tied up with, with morality, the form of the good. So interestingly, they think the ring almost always gets in the way. Unless you're using the ring in some kind of positive way. And it's weird. He picks a good example. Invisibility rings are hard to apply in a way that could actually help people. Easy to apply to steal stuff. Hard to apply in other scenarios. So Glaucon tries again. Right? He wants to make this point in a slightly different way. How are we doing on time? Somebody gotta watch. Eleven thirty-one. All right. Oh, plenty of time. All right. So Glaucon tries to make the point even more extreme. We ditch the analogy here and we we start a new question. He says, imagine that two people are completely identical. So they might as well be twins, except they have one thing that's different. Right? One of these guys is outstandingly immoral, a terrible human being. Yet he has a reputation. It is totally untarnished. He is thought of as a great character. In fact, he's a great arguer, and he's able to get out of trouble whenever he gets caught. Right? He's got a golden tongue, a great reputation, and he's a terrible human being. The next person, we have an outstandingly moral person, a saint, except he has a reputation for being a terrible human being. Who would you rather be? Would you rather be a saint who everybody hates, or would you rather be the villain who's got the money, power, power and fame, the ability to take all those things, and nobody, and he never gets caught? But to him, that's just in this world. That's not the next one. Fair enough. Let's talk about just this world then. Who's happier in this world? Still the saint. Mm -hmm. no. Glaucon is trying to make the case that the immoral person is always better off than the moral one. That in this scenario, the, the only reason he thinks that people care about morality is because it benefits them in some way. If you're good, people are usually going to think you're good. Right? Is there any positive benefit to you when people think you're a moral person? Think you are a moral person? Yes. Yeah, you're you're well-esteemed. You're liked. Right? 
What if I strip all that away? You're moral, but it comes with no societal benefit to you. Do you still care about it? Glaucon wants to say no. Plato does. Why does Plato still care about morality? Actually, it's easier if we ask it about Socrates. Socrates was outstandingly moral. He stood up for what's right. He would not do any injustice. How is his reputation? Killed for corrupting the youth, right? <laughs> so he's, he is actually a perfect example of this. A person who's moral but has a bad reputation. Was he happy? Mm -hmm. Can you think of anybody who's terrible? You don't have to call him out, all right? <laughs> who's terrible and has a reputation for being a great guy? How's their life? Good or bad? It looks good on the outside, right? When we judge a person's life, what do we look at? The outside. And the outside, here's what we see. Money, fame, power, wealth. Do you know anybody who has all these things and still has a terrible life? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. That's Plato's ultimate point here, is that the good life and the, pl and, and the pleasurable happy life are one and the same, even though it may not look like it. And the reason we don't realize that is because we've deceived ourselves into thinking that the wild horse should run the show. That fame, power, and wealth are actually indicative of a good life. But for Plato, the way you can actually tell if somebody has a good life is to do what? Ask yourself whether they have... Moral knowledge. Moral knowledge is part of it. A soul in harmony is what I'm looking for. Where desire is not running the show. You know what? Having your desires met might actually be part of the good life, but it's a small part. Not starving to death is part of the good life. But having a good life does not require that you're, you have this obsession with and focus on fleshly things. In fact, he thinks that that's actually detrimental to a good life. Focusing on the fleshly stuff backfires. Instead, what we should care most about is what? Not the fleshly stuff, but... Should it be the wild horse, the tame horse, or the charioteer, which is a run on the show? Charioteer. So he says our focus should be on reason and wisdom. That should be the governing, driving force in our life. And that when we focus on fame, power, and wealth, we're letting the wild horse run free. We're having a soul in disharmony, automatically harming ourselves. Just like a government, which allows the, the workers to run the show rather than the government. Right? That's, that's a society which is in a revolt. It's not healthy, right? If your society is in the middle of a revolt, do you think a good man is going to be able to live a good life? No, there's going to be no laws, there's going to, it's going to be terrible. Well, the same thing applies with the soul here. When you let desires run the show, you end up in a lawless state, one where your happiness is not guaranteed. Is Plato just pontificating over here, or is he actually making sense? Makes sense. Is it rhetoric, or is it you think he's actually on to something? On to something. Yeah? Would anyone put down the ring now? <laughs> it's still difficult, right? No matter how much he argues for it, turning down an invisibility ring is still a tricky task. Alright, so they keep asking these questions, and one of the questions that ends up coming up is, does morality benefit you? Does morality have to make you better off? Do you guys think that morality and well-being are linked? That moral behavior always improves your life? Let me, let me ask it a different way. What if being moral didn't help you out? Would you still care about it? Would doing the right thing matter to you if you didn't get some sort of reward or compensation out of it? Plato is pessimistic on this one. He wants to say that all good actions benefit you. That we wouldn't do good actions if it didn't benefit us in some way. Let's actually look at a quick video. I think my ethics class has already been seeing this. But it's going to give an example that reminds me so much of Plato when I saw it. It's actually a life insurance commercial, but it does seem relevant here.
ขาจะได้อะไรถ้าเขาทำแบบนี้ทุกวันเขาจะไม่ได้อะไรเลยไม่ได้รวยขึ้นไม่ได้ออกทีวีไม่มีใครรู้จักไม่ได้มีชื่อเสียงที่มากขึ้นเพราะสิ่งที่เขาได้คือได้แค่ความรู้สึกได้เห็นความสุขได้เข้าใจได้ความรักได้ในสิ่งที่เงินซื้อไม่ได้ได้โลกที่สวยงามกว่าเดิม Okay, he's aiming for happiness. What's the way to get it? Not through money. Money, fame, power, wealth, and freedom, right? No. no. So it tries to show us that happiness is obtained not by just the pursuit of your carnal pleasures and desires, but by something else. That the the more meaningful life, the more fulfilling life, the actual happiest life is one where the soul is going to be in harmony, where reason runs the show, where you have a commitment to morality. And that that's actually the way to properly order your soul and achieve the highest levels of happiness and well-being you can. Do you think he'd be happier if instead of helping those people out, he just hoarded the money and became rich? And that's Plato's point. He says the real key to happiness is not to um, screw people over just to get ahead in life and have the biggest bank account or the most Twitter followers, but to actually do something um, consistent with morality. Is he persuasive at all? Just, just not persuasive enough to put down the ring, right? <laughs> that, that ring's still tempting, right? <laughs> Which is why the Lord of the Rings makes an interesting joke. Um, all right, so all unhappiness stems from a lack of harmony amongst the parts of your soul, and if we realize that, then we will never seek to let our wild horse run free. That we'll try and keep it under wraps. So he says, "What we what we all aim for is happiness. We just don't all realize that the way to happiness is internal harmony." So he has a different understanding than most. Most people, he thinks, are going to pursue their desires in an unbridled way, but that that's actually not the most effective way to achieve what we want. In fact, will often backfire. Can you think of any examples where it does backfire, where people obtain riches? Like, let's give an example of a person who successfully gets money, fame, power, and wealth, and is still miserable. The CEO of Volkswagen. Okay. What and what happened? Was there, was there an event? They, they put they bump sensors in the uh, car so they pass emissions and get better emissions. Right. Worldwide. And how'd that turn out? Not very well. Yeah. Yeah, he resigned. They're all being refunded. Okay. Any other examples? People who win the lottery go broke in three years. Yeah, so it seems like they weren't so happy, right? We gave them what they wanted, and then you still end up miserable. I don't know. You give me $13 million. You said people that 
Look. No, they do the opposite. They pursue their pleasures, they gain fame, power, and wealth, and then it backfires on them. Somebody like Robin Williams comes to mind. Yeah. It's a controversial example there, but it looked like everything was awesome for him. Money, fame, power, wealth, positive influence on the world. Looks like everything's great, but you just can't tell whether people have internal harmony, whether they, they feel good about themselves just by looking at those outward things. All right, so we haven't talked about forms today. We talked about it a lot last class. Do you all believe in forms? As Plato describes them. This invisible world that's more real than this one that we can actually have knowledge about. Makes sense of what we can understand, but still It gives tons of arguments for it. How do you think of his arguments? Any obvious flaws? They at least look sound, right? Is there anybody have any reasons for being skeptical? Did he say anything that's wrong, or you have any information that's like, hey, this proves he's wrong. He's made a mistake somewhere. Is anyone still skeptical? Yeah. Do you have any reason for being skeptical? Or is it just like, ah, I just, I don't know. Do we have some justification for our skepticism, or are we just skeptical because we're stubborn? Are we all just stubborn? How is he not taking into consideration that our biological drive is to take care of ourselves and only ourselves or our immediate family? It has so, nothing to do with worrying about the one, other people outside of our... So you're talking about his morality now? Well, just his idea. I mean, he's questioning... He's not taking into consideration that we're very selfish people. We're designed that way. We're designed to survive by taking care of ourselves. I'm not worried about your great God. I'm not worried about if he eats tonight. You know? All right, so he does think we're selfish, but that's not a bad thing. The word selfish doesn't have a negative connotation. I want, I'm going to bring this back to forms in a second, but let's talk about his morality really quick. Morality is, we have a soul composed of three parts, right? Desire, spirit, and reason. Selfishness means you want to have as well-being maximized. You want to benefit yourself as much as you can. Well, how, what's the best way to benefit yourself? Desire. It's not. We convince, that's a lie we tell ourselves. Desire is not the best way to, to make ourselves happy. If you focus on desire, what happens to the rest of your soul? Harmony or disharmony? Disharmony. disharmony. That's bad for you. So an enlightened selfish person, a selfish person who actually understands what they want and how to get it, aims for a soul which is in union. So selfishness is no longer selfish, if that makes sense to you guys. It's no longer radically all about me. To be selfish means I want a soul in harmony, and does a soul in harmony involve helping others or hurting them? So selfishness is morality now. He's not saying human beings aren't selfish, he's saying enlightened selfish folks care about other human beings. That's part of what makes, that's in, built into what's moral, is that it benefits us too, inherently. So his idea of morality is selfish, but it's not radically selfish. It's not focused all on my own well-being. My selfishness, it benefits you too. But what about specifically what he says about forms? He says something like, two elephants share in common elephantness. So therefore, there's a whole other world where elephantness, or the form of elephant, exists. The elephant must refer to something, but we can't point towards anything and say that is elephantness. So there must be a whole other world where this concept exists. It's unchanging. Elephantness never changes over time, so it's unchanging and therefore something we can know about. So knowledge exists in this unknown world. It's an intense argument, very, very different from things we've been exposed to or probably thought about much before this class. Is there any reason to not think this whole other world exists? Yeah. I think because we can't like really see elephantness, we can't really believe that it's in a whole other world. Like it's Plato totally agrees with you. We will not, we will refuse to believe in stuff we haven't seen. Who else refuses to believe in stuff we haven't seen that might make an appearance in an analogy Plato makes? Is that ringing any bells? No, Socrates is very good at, at following evidence wherever it leads. Socrates? Plato may or may not give an analogy involving some people who trust their senses and it leads them astray. 
Ringing any bells? The allegory of the cave. The allegory of the cave, right? The people in the cave trust their senses oh, completely. Okay. They only believe in what they've seen, and they've only seen shadows. shadows. So they disbelieve in objects. And are they rational for doing so? They are totally wrong, right? They're... I think the thing that everybody is wrestling with is because Plato is accepting this world of forms almost as knowledge, as not as it's the truth. Right. And like in the allegory of the cave, kind of he's the guy that got out and saw this stuff. Yes, that's convenient. But it's like how, yeah, how <laughs> what did you see? And I know he gives all these arguments that like lead to it, but it's just too abstract to I think it's very abstract. abstract. Just like that's the same Oh, that's a good argument. Yeah, there's another one. <laughs> that's the same problem the people stuck in the cave have though. Because they haven't seen objects with their own eyes. It's too abstract for them to understand. <laughs> so they just disbelieve in it. <coughs> Well, maybe just take well, when time. he comes up to them and starts talking to the other prisoners, technically <coughs> they see him. Well, in the analogy, he, he doesn't do that. Oh, he doesn't okay. walk he in front of them and be like, mind. "Bam, your mind is blown!" Right? You can finally see. <laughs> Plato can't do that in real life. He, he can't hold a form and be like, "Guys, look, I no, prove it now." At least objects. Him as a person is an object. He goes up to these other prisoners. Right. I think the thing that's Ooh, that wouldn't work with the analogy, right? If, if he could actually, if he if he would accept or he would say that he believes it, like he can't actually know, but he's saying it's knowledge. He says it's knowledge. He's saying the reason is leading him to this knowledge, but it's a belief. Let me give the argument really fast why he says it's knowledge. He says, "Hey guys, look at this. I'm drawing a square in the ground, right? Mm -hmm. And then I I double the signs here, double the distance." And I know, wow, that's a terrible one. Wow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit right now. This is bad. He says, two triangles are half as big as four triangles. That is terrible, all right? Socrates, what happened here? Oh, OK, here's the problem. There you go. That's somewhat better. Man, that was painful. I'm going to have to edit the video on that one. <laughs> all right, so he says, we can actually know the second square is twice as big as the first. And do you agree with him that we can know that? Yeah. So the second we admit we have knowledge of it, he says our knowledge, we have knowledge. The knowledge is of the form of squares. The form isn't here. Did the drawing I draw, is the second square actually bigger, twice it's as big as the first? Perfect. It's not. But I understand the concept. So my knowledge is about concepts. And he calls the concepts forms. So it's weird. It's, it's, his arguments look good. Um, Next class, we're going to see some competing ideas, and it's going to be from his student. So his student's name is Aristotle, and he's going to be critiquing this idea of the world of forms. So I'll see you guys then. Go ahead and read chapter 7. Did you take roll? I did. I'll mark the